Okay, MLA. Uh, that's that's the mission and vision, which um, you can read. But the bottom part of, like any RDC, and, and having been in the role now for 12 months, one of the first things that uh, became apparent since I took the role is we are not an industry representative organisation. We are an industry service provider. Industry provides the strategy and the direction of which MLA, as an RDC, carries out the, uh, the marketing and research and development for industry. So we don't lobby government for drought relief and so forth. There's the board, made up of uh, producers, uh, who are mostly uh, just about all levy payers that, that are there. Um, and there's the uh, structure of the senior leadership team. Uh, like a lot of RDCs, becoming very much a collaborative approach uh, and redesigned the organisation over the last 12 months. The other thing is that uh, once you become a director of MLA, you don't all of a sudden pass to the dark side. There's a lot of very passionate directors on our board, very passionate about the industry, but to be on the MLA board, you, um, it's a skills-based board. It's not an agro-political board, it's, it's a skills-based board. And we have a selection committee which industry picks on that selection committee the people that are nominated for the board. Okay, um, there's our structure uh, in, the, in the red meat uh, industry. At the top is the Red Meat Advisory Council and uh, Meat and Livestock Australia gets levies from the feedlot industry, the grass-fed cattle industry, the uh, goat industry and the sheep meat industry sitting there under MLA. The live export industry has its own structure. ALIC, who are the live exporters paying their own levies to Live Corp and levies to ALIC to represent the industry. So a clear distinction between MLA and the live export industry. MLA for live export only does gap analysis, training on the ground and nutritional value uh, so far through the feedlots and uh, S-gas training uh, in country. Uh, like a lot of RDCs, we don't collect the levy. The levy actually is collected by the Department of Agriculture, distributed MLA, Animal Health Australia and the National Residue Survey. If a levy comes in as a lamb levy, it can only be spent on lamb marketing or lamb R&D. And there's the breakup of the levy uh, for grass-fed cattle and lamb. So lamb's on a percentage base of the sale price, whereas grass-fed cattle and, and cattle in general is a flat $5 per head. So that's industry structure. We've just relaunched uh, our website because some of the criticism of MLA was that levy payers didn't know where all the money went. Clearly on our website now is access to where the money goes. Uh, maintaining and improving market access, which has been a lot of gains around market access in the last two years and quite a few more gains to come uh, along the way, particularly for lamb in, in perhaps the, the EU over the next uh, two to three years. Growing demand, increasing productivity across the su supply supply chain, uh, supporting industry integrity systems like the national vendor declarations and so forth, uh, stakeholder communication reporting and then the corporate expenses. All there on the website to clearly see. So MLA receives producer levies but the other thing that MLA does across the red meat industry is that uh, it has what we call a donor company. So the federal government has since the inception of uh, Meat and Livestock Australia given to uh, the red meat industry 0.5% of the gross value of agricultural production each year. So in other words, 40 or $50 million to match with private investment. Now that private investment uh, in the past, a lot of that's been through universities who get funding from state governments to do a project and that's matched through the donor company. MLA's role there is governance, so I appear in front of the Senate four times a year around how we spend the levy, and particularly the donor company levies. And so we do the governance and we also make sure there's no duplication of R&D between the levies and the donor company. Um, and there's some of the R&D now. Now Matt McDonald, the head, head of our uh, R&D, is going to go through a lot more of these uh, later today. But, but quickly, I put that slide up to demonstrate the return on the levy. Uh, you'll hear a lot of uh, antagonists in the industry say that MLA's collected $1.6 billion in levies over the last uh, decade, which is about $160 million a year, obviously. Uh, last year, uh, MSA, the difference between grading in your beef uh, system, if the difference between grading MSA and not grading MSA delivered $213 million back to Farmgate. So that is, if you had cattle grade MSA and you got the premium of 29 cents a kilo carcass weight, or 70 or $80 a head, we, we, the return was 213. Then you take in the improvements in sheep genetics and the southern beef genetics. Uh, I'm quite comfortable that uh, the levy, 
and that's just R&D, has, has certainly generated a good return for levy payers over the last uh, 10 years. A lot of what we also do is a lot of sensory testing of consumers. So understanding what consumers are thinking. And, and a lot on these slides is about what consumers are thinking, and I'm happy to share them, but in interest of time, I'm not gonna go through everything there. But just to say to you, domestically, the consumers trust Australian farmers. Uh, and, and they have an innate level of trust for you. Our job is to make sure that it stays that way. Uh, it's, it's since things like 2011, uh, you know, things around environment and welfare, their concerns as consumers have gone up, but uh, which I'm sure all of you well and truly appreciate is that uh, the, the wave of consumerism is around wanting to know uh, from where and how product is produced. Um, so these are some of the comments that we're getting back. You can't tell where the meat came from. You can tell the price and the taste. That's about it. It's hard to find straightforward information. It's either, either crazy vegans, so I apologise to the vegans in the crowd, or hardcore meat eaters. I apologise to you too. But um, uh, that's the sort of sensory information we get, which leads to things like this that's on YouTube at the moment, just this little link which I'm going to show you, which is around using social media and people that have a following on social media. Uh, so what the tape will show is Rudy from Bondi Rescue. Okay, now Rudy has, from Bondi Rescue, I know it looks like Matt McDonald, the head of R&D, coming out of the surf, but when he does, we get a little bit of sound. I'm not going to show the whole hey video. Hey guys, I'm Rudy from Bondi Rescue, and I've just swum from Sydney all the way up to central Queensland. As you know, I'm a lifeguard, and I love the ocean. And today, I'm here to swim upstream, to speak to some farmers and researchers, and find out exactly what the... Perfect. Well done, guys. Uh, so that's the sort of stuff that we're using on social media. So there's uh, Rudy talking to the people that consume your product, because uh, he's obviously got a following in Sydney. And then we have another guy called uh, Andrew Ulysses, who does uh, the feedlotting industry. And he's like the Bear grills of uh, Australia. He jumps in the feedlot bunker and he, he eats like a cow and carries on. Uh, but he has 70,000 followers. On, on social media. 70,000 followers who are consumers of red meat in the demographic that we want to touch directly or engage with directly, uh, you know, that 20 to 35 year old consumer. Uh, what's happening, some of the projects that, that are happening through, um, through the donor company. So these aren't levies, this is the donor company work. So this is the work we're doing with, with the donor company. A lot of the red meat industry, when it comes to paying you on a carcass weight, a lot of the measures, or the bulk of the measures, measures are subjective. When you go through a chiller and, and you're being paid on intermuscular fat, because that's a piece of meat with intermuscular fat or marbling, it's all subjective, it's a chip. And the meat colour and the intermuscular fat uh, and the fat colour and the square eye muscle area of what you produce is all done by a human being. Industry's moving very quickly to doing a hyperspectral imaging, which gives you that image there, which gives you a objective measure of intermuscular fat and marbling. And anyone that's in uh, the beef industry will know that marbling is a real uh, price differential when it comes to being paid for the product you're producing. In, in lamb, uh, Dexter, X-ray machines. We have a fully automated boning room now operating in Australia, doing about 10,000 lambs a day. A lamb carcass comes out of the chiller, goes through an X-ray machine, a dual X-ray machine, telling robots where to cut the lamb up. And it's getting to a point where that is then becoming supermarket shelf ready. Okay, so that is making all the measures that we'll put on top of those systems completely objective around eye muscle area. So perhaps both sheep and beef will get to value-based um, marketing, but value-based returns on a square eye muscle area of the product you're producing. All this then flows right back to uh, genetics and genomics on farm around how to get more money for the product you're selling and taking out that subjective measures. Uh, beef marketing campaign, uh, hopefully you've seen the beef one. I won't have time to show it today, but uh, the, the biggest 
problem with the beef domestic marketing campaign has been the lamb one, because the lamb one's been so successful that uh, in the last 12 months I've been beaten over the head about the beef one. We're on top of the beef one. It's about giving consumers the, the right to go back out and buy beef because of the huge protein hit it gives. If we just get uh, one more house, we get each household in Australia to buy one more meal annually of beef, it's worth $33.6 billion to us. That's just one more meal a year. So the household these days is not a wife and a couple of children. Uh, men make a lot of the decisions around what's, uh, what's going to happen at mealtime. And we're, um, from this campaign, which incidentally has gone to, uh, as a campaign, not just the ad, but the campaign's been nominated as a finalist in a New York global uh, marketing campaign. I know awards don't sell products, but in every um, Western society, consumption of red meat's been declining as nutritionists and dietitians are telling people, balance your diet. Uh, a lot of this, and, and some of the data we're starting to see is we're starting to see a plateau of that effect and, and actually an increase in consumption of red meat. Um, on our website as well, you can see exactly where the levies are spent by country across the world. Approaching 80% of the beef produced in this country has been exported. Uh, 60 to 65% of the land has been exported. 35%, the USA is 35% of our export market. Uh, so it's it's very important market to us. Only 1% of the US population eats lamb. So website, you can see exactly where the levies are spent globally. On a global branding position and promotion, uh, True Aussie, which has been a brand that MLA developed about uh, two years ago and has launched in market across the world, is just what everyone's now talking about in agriculture, which is one brand for all products coming out of Australia under an agricultural brand. So we've been asked if we'd share all our learnings from True Aussie and the brand with the rest of agriculture. We're doing that and seeing where it leads. But fundamentally, if you go to a Japanese or a Korean supermarket or through the Middle East, you'll see True Aussie in the supermarket shelves and Australian product sitting with inside the flags and all the promotion around Australian product. Integrity systems, anyone that's had anything to do with the National Vendor Declaration. Um, MLA doesn't control the National Vendor Declaration, all the questions on it. We don't charge the price for it. Uh, industry does. We are the service provider. We provide the levies to make sure that these industry systems function. I say that because I um, did get a barrage of phone calls and emails telling me what people thought of me because we changed the questions on the National Vendor Deck and re-released it. That wasn't actually a decision that MLA had anything to do with. Um, but the fact that underpinning True Aussie is these integrity systems. So the previous slide around True Aussie, we are very much promoting the traceability and the clean green image that Australian product already has across the world. When I travel the world, it's not about what the French are doing or the USA is doing or New Zealand's doing. They're all envious of what we do. And, and I've, it's got nothing to do with me because I've only been with MLA for 12 months. But MLA has a reputation and the Australian industry has a reputation as being very aggressive around free trade agreements and the marketing of their products in markets that we have. That's why we have the number one position in Japan and we have the number one position in South Korea. The USA is now our biggest market. Uh, we have a chef in the Middle East uh, who, who has a TV program, so he's an Australian, he's an employee of MLA, only promotes Australian red meat. Uh, he was at Beef Week telling the crowd about how 500 million people took his signal on his cooking show and he was horribly disappointed because only 300 million turned him on. Um, there's MLA website, so you can go on the new MLA website launched last month and go into grass-fed cattle, grain-fed cattle, uh, sheep and lambs, goats, and, and what we do around promoting the end product and see the levy streams that fall behind that and what is invested where across our new website. Uh, the cattle industry for the last two years. The fundamental issue why cattle prices have been so low for the last two years against what has been a huge global demand has been this massive uh, turn off of Australian cattle, uh, particularly on the eastern seaboard, that happened in 2013 and 14. 2014, 9.3 million cattle slaughtered and 1.28 million cattle live exported, which was the largest turn off of cattle uh, in Australia's history. 
which obviously put pressure on the processing plants uh, and it's going to have a flow on effect that you can see now that's, that's going to flow on from a pure uh, supply and demand industry that we're in. So we do believe that the, the, the cattle herd will drop to a low not seen for 20 years, but this is relatively in line, was in line with what's happened in the USA, uh, which is their cattle herd's the lowest it's been in 60 years. Hence why you've got such strong global demand for, for beef. Eastern Young Indicator, last night it sat at uh, $5.50. Uh, so that's a carcass weight, and that's just, the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator is just a sale yards price for uh, uh, C2 and C3, 220 steers and heifers to about 320 kilos. So it's, it's just a measure, and you can see from that slide where the five year average has been and where we are today. Uh, I think Wagga climbed through yesterday to 600 cents a kilo carcass weight. So if you convert 600 cents a kilo carcass weight to a steer back to live weight, the average steer in Australia would yield 54%. So that means the average steer in the sale yard system at Wagga is making 330 cents a kilo live weight. That's the average. Good Angus, good feedlot steers are making more. Uh, there's a slaughter that's been happening around, around cattle. It is still as high this year as it was last year in our record year. And the issue for Australian herd is that we've been slaughtering over 50% of our females. And the Brazilian herd in comparison is around 32 or 33%. Um, but lamb and, sh and sheep and lamb, what's, what's happening in sheep and lamb? So five months in 2014, there's the lamb slaughter. For the full year, we slaughtered 22.25 million lambs and 10 million sheep. Uh, this year, we're up 5% in lambs and down 21% in sheep slaughter. I'll quickly move through these slides, just give you an indication of, of what's happening around lamb slaughter. But fundamentally as a nation, we're producing more lamb. Your carcasses are getting heavy, heavier, and we're getting more value for those carcasses, which is increasing the total uh, output off farms. So you can see there the slaughter slaughter's reasonably um, uh, on track with where it's been in previous years, slightly up, slightly down, depending on which month it is, um, but a historically high lamb turnoff. So we're, we've moved into now a more consistent area of producing lamb as a nation. Uh, so carcass weight is increasing. As I said, uh, you know, your 22, 23, 24 kilo carcasses export markets, particularly the USA, back to the 18 to 20 kilo carcasses, which is the domestic market. We cannot forget about the domestic market in lamb. It is our strongest market. Uh, it, it is 40%, obviously 60, 65% of lambs being exported. That means that our strongest market is our domestic market. Um, Mutton slaughter year on year, you can see the decline. Uh, and, and our national flock is, is 69.9 million, so under 70 million. However, it's obviously becoming a ewe-based female flock, ewe-based flock, producing a lot more uh, lambs than it has done in the past. Uh, so national turnoff continuing to, to grow. So there's the flock coming down, but the turnoff in the flock uh, being quite high. More productivity. Uh, lamb, lamb exports forecasted to be a record again this year. So that's both numbers and carcass weights that's producing that and the turnoff. So where's it all going? Um, you can see here in um, 12 and 14 that uh, that's the USA, UAE, the Middle East, the world, and then China starting to grow. Uh, but the USA uh, is, is a big destination for Australian lamb. And as I said, only 1% of the population actually eats lamb. Uh, China, the largest producer and consumer. So China's got a big flock, but they're also a very large um, consumer of lamb. New Zealand, uh, New Zealand raced to the dairy industry and got out of sheep and lambs. So they're our largest competitor, obviously, in terms of uh, what they produce. We, we produce about uh, 20 million to 22 million. They're around 30 to 35, and they're only gonna be around uh, 30 million. Where's prices going to be? Um, so uh, dom domestic lambs are around $5.86. dollars. I think the national average today is about $5.80. Look, as a long-term average, depending on what time of the year you're selling them, 
and, and, and whether there's uh, seasonal conditions that are unfavourable, one would think that uh, the long-term average is between $4.50 and $5 a kilo carcass weight. Uh, so in conclusion, there's the total numbers. The total lamb production, uh, record lamb exports and lamb prices to reduce seasonally but remain strong. And then again, is just another slide showing you around the growth in the, um, uh, the, the, the what's happening in New Zealand in terms of uh, Australia catching New Zealand and bridging this gap in production. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to add is the Australian Day ad campaign. I think I whipped through that. I must be someone was going to give me a signal at 25 minutes. So the only other thing I'd like to add is is the Australian Day uh, ad campaign with Rich, the late Richie Benno. Uh, that campaign. Uh, as a matter of interest, the ad won uh, ad of the year, Australian ad of the year. The campaign came runner-up to a little-known company called Coca-Cola, uh, and, and the Coke campaign had a spend of 40 times greater than the Lamb one. Uh, so it was quite an achievement. But that's one thing to have those awards. The other one was what were the returns. So obviously uh, at MLA, we've got to demonstrate the return on ad campaigns like that. We measure that by sales through the cash register the week leading in and the week leading out to Australia Day. Australia Day fell on a Monday this year uh, and sales increased uh, by 35% on that one day. So sales spiked on that day by 35.6%. On a Monday, our best ever record on a Monday has been about 10%. The, the, the campaign this year was the second best we've ever had. Uh, and as just as a sideline, the late Richie Benno was off contract with Channel 9. And when Channel 9 heard that we were getting Richie Benno to do the ad, they jumped on board. It made, us, it made it absolutely impossible for us not to go with Channel 9. They gave us about $6 million in kind because of all the crosses and all the things they did around the Australian ad campaign, which led to a 276 per turn return on investment. So an ROI of 276%. Uh, we're very proud of that campaign. We just need now to replicate it in beef and uh, we'll be on the right footing. So that's me. Thank you very much for... Uh